Hello everyone and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today's creation myth is that orphan genes refute common ancestry. This is silly, they do not. Before we get into this one, we need to cover a little bit of background information. So first, what are orphan genes? Sometimes you hear these called taxonomically restricted genes or TRGs, or sometimes just de novo genes. These are genes that are present in a single lineage, but not related lineages. And generally, they are restricted to a single species. So in this simple phylogeny right here, where we have our common ancestor at the root, and then a bunch of extant species at the terminal branches, the branches indicated with red and blue contain genes that are unique. There's a red gene and a blue gene that are only found in those two lineages, and we would consider those orphan genes. The creationist argument around orphan genes is that, according to evolutionists, common ancestry should strictly lead to nested hierarchies. And because orphan genes have no apparent ancestors or relatives, that's why they're called orphans, that is indicative of special creation rather than common ancestry. In fact, you'll hear some creationists argue that the presence of orphan genes specifically refutes common ancestry. A secondary claim from creationists surrounding orphan genes is that there's no mechanism to get new genes, so if you have genes in specific lineages, that's indicative that that lineage was specially created with that particular gene, because again, we can't make new genes out of nothing, that's what creationists will often claim. So why are the creationists wrong about orphan genes? Well, first we can talk about the mechanism of generating a new gene in a specific lineage. This mechanism has become increasingly well understood over the last decade or two, and basically it involves two steps. You have a region of DNA that's not a gene, it's not being translated ultimately into an amino acid sequence, and it needs to acquire two things. It needs to acquire the ability to be transcribed, and it needs to become translated. So you could have those in either order. And this uh, little schematic of this process is from Zhang 2019, which along with the other sources here is linked below. So you could acquire transcription and then become protein coding, or you could become amino acid encoding and then later on gain transcriptional activity. So let's look at those two steps in a little more detail. So one of the two things you need to do is go from non-transcribed to transcribed. You have a previously non-transcribed region of DNA that acquires transcriptional activity. Turns out this is surprisingly common. Here is one example of a paper that looks at this process. It's uh, called Origins of De Novo Genes in Human and Chimpanzee. It's from 2015. And this is just a quote from the abstract of the paper. The data support a model in which frequently occurring new transcriptional events in the genome provide the raw material for the evolution of new proteins. In other words, you have a region of DNA that gains the ability to be transcribed, and then that pool of transcribed but non-translated regions can subsequently become new protein encoding genes. But that's only one half of the process. You also have to have these non-translated regions that are transcribed need to gain the ability to be translated at ribosomes. And this is often accomplished through the acquisition of translational ability by long non-coding RNAs. That's what we see here, sometimes called link RNAs for long non-coding RNAs. So these are RNA transcripts that do not code for an amino acid sequence. But surprise, surprise, they can acquire that capability. So here we have a paper from 2012, hominoid-specific de novo protein coding genes originating from long non-coding RNAs. And more recent paper from 2015 that goes through this process in a little more detail. And I really encourage you, again, the links will be below, I encourage anyone watching to check out this paper because it's a nice overview of how this process works. So this is called Emergence, Retention, and Selection a trilogy of origination for functional de novo proteins from ancestral long non-coding RNAs in primates. So this again, it's a nice overview of what this process looks like and some of the evidence for this process. The takeaway here is we're putting together what this mechanism looks like to get these de novo genes, and the great thing about it is it leads to a prediction. If long non-coding RNAs become de novo genes, then we should be able to find the ancestral non-coding RNAs in related species. So let's see if that prediction is validated. 
In order to do that, we have to look at the phylogenetic evidence associated with these orphan genes. Now, the mechanism that we just went over actually explains the evolutionary history, because when we look, now that we know where to look, having figured out that mechanism, we actually find the predicted ancestral sequences. So this is a figure from that Zhang 2019 paper that I referenced earlier. This paper has to do with orphan genes in rice. And they look at a bunch of different species and lineages, and what they find is that you can see not just the orphan genes, but in the related species, you can see the ancestral sequences, the transcribed sequences that are not translated. You could even find the earlier sequences that aren't even transcribed, but they have the same, they share sequence homology with the more recently acquired transcriptionally active sequences. Now, the really cool thing about this is you can actually specifically reconstruct the pathways for several de novo genes in these species. And this is one such figure from this paper. I'm not going to go through this step by step, but what you can see here is you look at phylogenetically, when did these different species diverge from each other? You can look at the relevant location in the genome for each of these species, and you can actually see what changes had to occur over its evolutionary history to arrive at the de novo gene. So again, we're hearing from creationists that there's no apparent evolutionary history for de novo genes. They refute common ancestry. But when we actually look at the data and we look at the processes and the predictions that those processes lead to, we find extremely strong evidence for the evolution of de novo genes. The last thing I want to point out here is a creationist contradiction associated with orphan genes. Now, creationists claim that orphan genes refute common ancestry. Creationists also generally, not all, but generally young earth creationists accept common ancestry within limited groups, usually at about the family level of taxonomy. Well, this creates a problem because most orphan genes are found at the species level, not at the family level. In other words, within a family, you'll have one individual with that orphan gene and the rest of the family won't have it. But creationists also claim, again, that that family shares common ancestry. In other words, that that family is descended from a single created kind. Well, this means, according to the creationist position, orphan genes don't refute common ancestry. Or you can have some weird workaround where uh, the whole family was created, or I should say the common ancestor was created with that sequence and then everybody else lost it in exactly the same way, but one lineage kept it. You get all these weird workarounds that don't actually explain anything, but that's the kind of knots creationists will tie themselves into to try to resolve this contradiction. Needless to say, none of those resolutions actually solve the problem. So creationists are left with this contradiction, claiming that orphan genes refute common ancestry while also permitting common ancestry in their own model in groups where you find within specific species orphan genes. So to summarize, creationists claim orphan genes are a problem for evolutionary theory. They claim there's no mechanism for de novo gene formation and orphan genes refute common ancestry except the mechanism is increasingly well understood and the evolutionary history of these orphan genes is often very clear. They're descended from long non-coding RNAs as predicted once we figured out the mechanism. So not only do orphan genes not refute evolutionary theory, they are another extremely strong piece of evidence for evolutionary theory. So thanks for playing creationists, but try again. Now, I just want to say before I finish this up that if any creationists who are watching this have a problem with anything I'm saying, send me an email. Email is going to be in the description and you can come on and you can have as much time as you want to talk about this. And then I'll take what time I want to respond and we can have a conversation about it. I think that might be productive and it would help iron out some of the differences that we have on these various issues. So once again, if you're a creationist and you think I'm wrong about anything I just said, shoot me an email if you want to and you can come on and we can talk about it. I will give you as much time as you want to make your case. So do orphan genes refute common ancestry? No, that is a myth. As we just saw, they're actually extremely strong evidence for common ancestry. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Don't get fooled.